So I'll just go over some of the winter things that I like. Some things you'll see the transition of plants from spring plants. Like I don't think I have any uh, spring things right now. No rhododendrons, no azaleas, no. It's all fall color and winter evergreens. So you'll see this ebb and flow at the garden center, mainly because our garden center, we're, we're a inspiration garden center. We're kind of like the wild place. So we want plants that are like, wow, oh my gosh, I can't believe they look this good. So you'll see this, 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 this things look good. And a couple lessons as we go through. What I thought I would start with are the evergreen shrubs. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with this one. Very, very common. Your grandparents grew this one. Anyone know what it is? Heavenly bamboo, exactly, or Nandina. This is Domestica. This is the tall one, so you can use this to soften up. Like all the new homes, I love that brick cinder block look. It drives me crazy. I feel like I'm in a prison or something. So I always want to soften this up to kind of break it up some. For me, I don't have cinder block. I've got cedar. It's a little bit soft, but still, when you fence me in, I feel, I want it to feel like a secret garden, not like a, like a fence. And so I'll use these to soften up the edges because it'll get up to about six foot height. I use, use these in containers. But the lesson here is not this one. What you'll get, we've got some new varieties coming out. Uh, this is uh, Sienna Sunrise. It's related to this, it's a cousin, but it stays denser. And the real secret is it's evergreen. The more sun it's exposed to, this color, this bronzy color turns almost like a flame red like a beautiful red color. If it's in the shade more, it'll stay green. But that same leaf will turn red, then turn green. Turn red, then turn green. It has these white flowers that come up, red berries. Uh, there's even some dwarf varieties. Harbor Dwarf will sell. It only gets up about a foot tall and then spreads out. So this is a great one for here because it's, our zone is perfect for it, for the transition. Then animals, especially in that wildland interface, uh, Havilena don't bother it, deer don't eat it. I mean, it looks delicious. I mean, I even want to add a little ranch dressing and go, yum. But animals just don't bother it. It's got kind of a sap, it's got a white sap. You break off the limbs, uh, but easy to maintain. It depends on the variety. That one only gets about chest high. Um, this one, you folks from the East Coast know what this is. This is uh, U, Y-E-W, it's an evergreen. Puts red berries on, little tiny insignificant flower, but the berries are kind of red. The lesson I want to bring with this, my front yard is very high fashion, high color. It's, it's where all my work is. I've got lots of flowers. I love going out and deadheading flowers, sipping coffee. That's my thing. Uh, so that's where all the work is. It's small though. The backyard, which, which is the biggest area, is very low maintenance, native. I never want to go back there and have to work or slave. So I use a lot of native low water stuff. That is where we grill, entertain, hot tubs, fire pits. It's where a lot of people hang out though, is in the backyard. Uh, so I use this one. I have a two-story stucco part of the house. It's a classic dugout house, two-story, overlooking Vista, overlooking Granite Dells, it's pretty. It was shaded though, I couldn't grow natives up there. And so I'm going, what can I do? I gotta do something with this wall. So I took this beautiful piece of art, it's a face about this big, Looks gorgeous. I've elevated it up on the wall, painted it red. I mean, it just glows. It goes, whoa, that's pretty cool. Then it needed something to frame it because it's just a big head on a two-story stucco wall. That's not so good. So I took two of these Hicks U's on either side. They're now over a story tall. They're about a story and a half tall. Big green pillars. So they really softened up the wall and made it feel, feel like a garden, not like a, not like a wall. And so, and I put it on my drip system that runs the, the native section, which is I water about every 10 to 14 days. This is not a native. I thought it was kind of a half experiment, half uh, uh, um, will it grow there? Um, it has done fabulous. What I found is I can intermix some ornamentals in my native gardens because this is shaded. Uh, it just doesn't dry out as fast as things out in the full sun. So it's done really magnificent because I didn't want to put a separate drip system in the backyard. I just want natives. This is what you get. Uh, deal with it or die. Figure it out. But use this great little evergreen for you. This is the color it looks in the spring. This color it looks like in the winter. This is the color it looks like in the summer. This is what you get all the time. Use. 
policy. Another one a companion plant would use are hollies. Oops. Ripped it, ripped it right out of there. I wonder what I do. Speak up. Oh, here. Are we back online? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess so. I gotta figure out the wireless solution. Hollies. Again, the Midwest, East Coast folks love hollies. Hollies actually adapt very well here in the shade. Other parts of the country, they grow in full sun. Not so much here. I would say another one like that is, is Japanese maples. They grow in California in full sun, the Midwest, full sun, not here. Uh, the, the tag says full sun, not here. Here our sun is more intense. This plant will take a, a surprising amount of sun, but I find it does best in the east coast, east uh, exposure to direct west exposure. Uh, but it's just classic evergreen. We probably have four or five varieties. The reason it does so well has this really waxy leaf. And so it just doesn't dehydrate as fast. It's got natural built-in defenses. The secret is you just got to plant it in a more strategic place, more shaded areas than, than more sun areas. Okay, and that red berry. I mean, you just want to bring it in for the holidays and make a Christmas dinner table display or something. Yeah. Do the deer and javelina like that? Uh, no, they seem to leave them alone. Yeah, she should be okay. Same with the yew. It's actually poisonous. So if you... If you want to kill yourself, make a UT or something, or you got puppies, probably don't get this one. There's some things. I'm putting together an article right now on plants to stay away from if you've got puppies. It's not quite in the can yet. It's still in my phase, thinking phase, but I'm, just, I'm going to write an article on that one. This one is uh, rosewood. Doesn't look like much, but if you're into native stuff, this one is hardcore native. You see this growing wild. In Skull Valley, uh, from Baghdad all the way up to the backside of Copper Basin. You've seen this one grow wild. It's a bush about like this big, thick evergreen. But once this gets up to size, um, I would cut it off of all care and all water, all fertilizer. I would just never do anything with it again. Right now, when they're young, they look a little, little, little rougher than let's say the Nandina or Hollies, but, but if you're into natives, this is a great one. Rosewoods are a good evergreen native tree for here. This is in my backyard. And again, once I get it rooted up to size, I just cut off, cut off the irrigation and never think about it again. I might give it a haircut to keep it shaped a little bit, but it's just no care, okay? Any flowers on that? No real flowers, no real, yeah, it's got a little flower, but really it's a big evergreen bush, that's it. This one we already spoke about. This is Eliagnus or Silverberry. I think this is a far better choice than Red Tip Botinia. Gets up about head high, about this big and wide, thick as can be. You cannot, and once it gets up to something, you can't kill it unless you overwater it. That's how you're gonna kill this one. So neglect it, treat it with less care, go on that RV trip across country for a month. Come back, the irrigation failed day two of you leaving. This is still alive, everything else in the, in the landscape is dead. This is like cactus or, or, or manzanita or some of those things. What we found though is it looks kind of native-y. It's got that you know, green silver leaf thing. Yeah, some people don't like it, so we figured out how to do this with it. All of a sudden we're selling, we can't keep these in stock. This is the exact same plant with a variegation. It's got the gold color to it. Again, it gets up about this high. You can use it as a screen. Um, again, evergreen. I use a lot of these. This is Ellie Agnes or Silverberry. So just think Ellie and Agnes, two old school names, and then put them together. That's the Latin name. Or uh, uh, Silverberry is a common name. This is another native. Um, this is gray leaf, Cotoneaster or Cotton Easter is how you spell it. Gets up about like this tall. Kind of, kind of a nice gray. If you like that Arizona, it's got an Arizona look to it. If you like that, this is great. If you've got a lot of light colored rock in your lawn, this would be a great contrast plant for that. So if you've got a lot of manzanitas, lots of green, and you want that contrasting blue silver color, this is a great one. Again, get it up to size, and once it's, once it's up to size, no more care, no maintenance, it just goes by itself. Okay, good, good Arizona plant for here. The ones your grandparents grew were this one. You know what that is? 
Pyracantha. But pan, yeah, Pyracantha or fire thorn. See how that it does have a little thorn on it. This one happens to be a bush form. It also comes in Victoria, the tall variety, but it forms these berries. I think this is a plant I'm trying to reintroduce, bring it back to life because it's so hardy here. I put this into, into commercial settings quite often. I mean, commercial schools, graveyards, I mean, they, they kill everything. I mean, just everything is just death and decay. This one seems to last. So I'm trying to go, this one's hardy enough for us to, this is a, this is a, I like to travel. I like freedom kind of town. So this is one you can plant and get going. It still looks great. Gets the berries every year. This is one of the birds in the winter when the berries are fermented will start eating the berries and just become, they're stumbling around on the fence because they're just drunk. This is another great winter plant. Every yard needs one of these. Uh, this is uh, Oregon grape or Mahonia. Oregon grape, it's, this has got a holly leaf, but this will take blistering hot sun. Surrounded by asphalt, it will still do great. Loves the heat. We've got three models. One that gets this high, hip high, and ankle high. So you gotta pick the variety, what height I want for my gardens. But the reason I brought this is, again, this is kind of like Nandina. The more sun it's in, the brighter the reds. It'll actually turn a different color, very pretty. If it's in more shade, which is where you see it growing wild, up in the Bradshaws, those areas, um, it just stays green. Uh, but in the sun, it just adapts really well. It just does great. In the spring, it has this cluster of red, of uh, uh, yellow flowers that blooms. Give us a tag on that. Sometimes I'll put that in note. And then it forms a little blueberry, thus the name Oregon grape. Uh, sometimes I'll make grape jelly out of it. Uh, you'll never get to do that. First of all, the harvest is really small. And then the birds just think they've died and gone to heaven when the berries form. So they love the berries on this one. And then of course, we're trying to introduce more manzanitas, more varieties of manzanita. They're just hard to grow. Oh man, the loss rate is like 50%. We put a crop in, you're gonna throw away half of them. So just, it's hard to, and it's a long crop, it takes forever. And so we're half struggling to get them to propagate and do well and then transplant. You can't just take a cutting and stick it. You can't just take a pup from underneath a bigger plant, just plant it, they die every time. They're kind of sensitive. I've tried to grow this manzanita. This is a tall manzanita. Gets up like this big. Has a little bit bigger leaf than our native one that grows here, but it's equally as hardy. Red stems. Here's the lesson on this. I am not able to grow this in my yard. I've tried five times. <laughs> And I'm a gardener, hardcore. I've got heavy clay soil and I'm on a north slope. With that north slope always shaded, snow loads up, it doesn't drain, I can't get enough perk. I can't get the soil to drain fast enough for this plant. And so I've abandoned the idea of manzanita. I may try to get in a pot or something, I don't know. Five times, it gets discouraging though. Uh, so I, what I've done is I've switched to junipers. Sacrilege to some of you, but we're in juniper forest. Junipers love growing here. And I'm taking some of the brighter colors, some of the gold golds, some bright uh, uh, silver colors. And I'm, I'm using those, and they just they thrive in that area. So manzanitas work well. We'll have probably three, four varieties of manzanita that we'll have cycle through. I think we're securing some sources. Some farmers are actually some some nerds, plant nerds. They've grown everything and they're tired of growing stuff, but they're still have a backyard farm that they kind of use, and they're into manzanitas. I think, in fact, Lisa is talking to one right now in the office.